Hey folks, Quilly Team here, and welcome to a brand new Let's Play for Hearts of Iron 4! We're going to be playing as Italy in this run, and we are currently on patch 1.8.1 with all the expansions, up to and including Man the Guns, and with no mods for this one. I've been enjoying playing a lot of Kaiserreich and Old War Blues and various things, but it is going to be nice to go to vanilla. In particular, one of the things that came up in our actually currently ongoing at the type of time of recording kaiserite campaign over in china is that we've finally grown to the point from our tiny little rebellion as the left camp to the point where we have a fair amount of holdings and would like to start building a navy and it occurred to me even though man the guns have been out for a while i don't think i've played a single major naval power since man the guns came out and one of the big things in that expansion is well a complete redo of how the naval stuff works so i thought you know what Let's go and play a major naval power and um, and and try to get that that experience under our wing before La Résistance comes out in about a month or so from the time of recording. So hopefully we'll be getting all this wrapped up before then. Anyway, all that to say, we're going to be playing as Italy. And why Italy? Well, Italy, I think, has a lot of potential for being super fun. It is one of the weakest of the majors, but it's still a major. One of the things I like about it, it is a major naval power but it's not really spread out. Like if you compare the United Kingdom, France, even something like the Netherlands, right? They've got, they've got bits all over the stupid place. And I don't wanna have to deal with that kind of just being kind of spread out. I wanna be a little bit more focused early on. Now, Italy does have some holdings in Africa, of course, and especially will after we finish the war with Ethiopia. But I almost feel that like parts of Africa are almost, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it feels, it's not, it's not contiguous, but it, it's, it feels like it's part of the same thing. Like going from, from Southern Italy to Northern Africa. I mean, if we control the Mediterranean, which I think is going to be one of our major goals is Italy here. What, what's the big deal? Let's just, you know, just a little skip across a, a little puddle. What? No big deal at all. So anyway, we're going to play as Italy in here. We're going to play on elite difficulty. Um, we're going to play with a historical AI focuses off. We're going to talk about that once we get into the game, but elite difficulty. So I actually haven't done a let's play on elite difficulty yet. And it is fairly challenging. The 15% penalty to political power game is, is pretty punishing. And yet it is the least of our concerns. The 30% production efficiency cap is actually brutal for our equipment production and is going to affect a few things about how we, how we think about our equipment plans. But I think the big thing is the 30% research speed penalty. I mean, this is momentous. This is monstrous. So we're, we're basically making a third less research, or the way to look at it is other people are effectively going to be doing 50% more research than we are. For every time we research two techs, other nations will research three. I think, I think that's correct. I think I'm doing the math. I mean, this is, you know, sort of back of the hand calculation. But yeah. Meanwhile, the AI does get a bonus for reduced fuel consumption, but I don't know how much we'd really notice that one way or to other. But yeah, this research speed is going to, it's going to hurt my heart. So in practice, it means we're going to have to like cut some aspect of our normal research. There's going to be some, some area of technology we're simply not going to pursue so that we can maintain parity in others. Anyway, let's go ahead and start the game. By the way, um, if you are new to the channel, um, and honestly, there's there's a lot of setup here, but there's a very good possibility we are not going to unpause in this first episode. It may all be set up, and just a lot of discussion about our plans. So, uh, so strap down for that. Um, I think it is very likely we're going to go communist on this run. Why? It doesn't necessarily make things easier or better, but I think it might be interesting. Italy is interesting in that its national focuses do not require any kind of faction whatsoever. You can pretty much do, or I, by faction, I mostly mean um, political leaning, like, you know, fascist versus communist versus democratic versus non-allied, I guess would be the last one. Um, none of them matter for any of their, their ideas. Now, it is a fairly small national focus tree. Um, it is, you know, one of the originals. I mean, it, it may have been tweaked since the original release. I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember. But it, it's not very big, especially since I have been playing Kaiserreich and things, which have huge focus trees. That being said, one of the difference between Vanilla Hoi 4 and something like Kaiserreich is Kaiserreich ha is very story and event driven, and it is a lot of fun. With those, I'm mostly like, okay, I'm not going to do any weird tricks. I'm not going to color outside the lines. I'm going to do the focus tree and see where the story leads us. And actually, I've always liked doing that in Hearts of Iron in general, but here we are going to have to do a few things outside of 
just where the focus tree lends us because there's a few things well, I'm hoping to accomplish. Long-term goals for the campaign, it would be very nice if we could hit this button to realize Roman ambitions. So this would let us reform ourselves. Instead of being Italy, we would be known as Imperium Romanum, the Roman Empire, and it requires us that we control everything around the Mediterranean, plus France, plus the United Kingdom, plus all the way, we need the province of Holland, which is over here. I don't know if we need Friesland, but we do need the province of Holland, and there may be a few other bits. This is gonna be a very, very, very long-term affair if we get there. We'll have to see how it goes. But that got me thinking a little bit about what factions and what alliances we might want to be a part of. It's possible, it's potentially even probable, that the easiest way to play the game early on will in fact be, or would in fact be, to join the Axis and use the backing of Germany to help beat uh, France into submission early on in particular would be kind of handy. Um, and then, especially, we do have to take over the United Kingdom. I don't know if we have to take over Ireland. Um, I feel like the answer is no. Uh, British, England, whoops, Br England, Wales, Egypt. Oh, yeah, we don't even need Scotland. I guess that makes sense. Hadrian's Wall and whatnot. Um, so that might be handy. On the other hand, we might actually come into a conflict with the Axis holdings in what some sort of expansion Germany might do or or some things over here in the Balkans that might conflict with our plans. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that we might not be able to rush it. It might not mean we couldn't just leave the Axis later on and, and make some change. But here's the thing I'm thinking of is how about we just join the, the common term, have the backing of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union plus Italy to try to uh, limit Germany's uh, shenanigans might be kind of handy. It could also be interesting if Spain goes Republican Spain and then becomes communist. That has some pros and cons. Obviously, it would help us a lot in our conquest um, in, well, France and also Northern Africa. Uh, later on, it could cause some problems because uh, we do have to, if we want to make the new Roman Empire, we do need Spain. So if they go Republican and join the common term, we may eventually have to leave the common term and declare war against them, which is not something I'm very keen on. So really the ideal is that national Spain wins. And as it turns out, that is one of the very few ideas in our tree where it would be helpful to, well, actually... Do we need... Oh, we still do need to be fascist for this. I thought we didn't need to be fascist or anything, but technically, demand the Balearic Islands requires that we're still fascist at that point. But I guess it doesn't matter... Is there even a reference in here for it to actually be Nationalist Spain? Original... I mean, I'm assuming Nationalist Spain has to win for us to support Nationalist Spain and then demand the Balearics. But at a, at a brief glance, I don't actually see that. Uh, will it be abandoned if current party is it worth it? I don't know. Anyway, let's get back to this. Let's talk about our starting situation. Italy is the only country, well, <clears throat> also Ethiopia. Italy is the only country in the game that starts in a war, which is kind of interesting. It's one of the reasons that they use Italy as the tutorial nation, because you can teach people the basics to warfare right away in the tutorial. Italy is not easy to play necessarily, but it's got a little bit of everything, which is why it makes it a great tutorial nation. So we do start the war with Ethiopia, which is very easy to win. Now, if you if you micromanage some stuff, if you do a little bit of manual shenanigans, uh, you can speed things along, but ultimately you're going to win really quickly. Uh, I think the typical start with Italy in terms of focuses is you're going to start on the Ethiopian war logistics. And I was like, it's an interesting race of which one's going to finish first. And in practice, uh, the vast majority of the time, the war finishes before the Ethiopian war logistics national focus happens. So this would, if we started now, it would be finished around the end of February, and usually you can wrap the war up before then. We do need to make some armies, so we're going to do that now. All the troops on the northern flank of Ethiopia, we're going to put into one army. All the troops on the southern flank, we're going to put in another army. Both of these armies are going to be added to the same army group over here, so we're going to grab ourselves a field marshal. Um, Italy doesn't have a tremendous pool of commanders to choose from, unfortunately. So we've got a single skill two field marshal, um, Rodolfo Grazzini over here. Uh, he does start with enough, um, 
with, with the trait unlock, I would like to get Charismatic. I really like the increased recovery rate. I think it's super duper handy. Um, whether you're on the offense or the defense, recovering your organization faster feels incredibly important. Now, we don't have any command power right now, so we're gonna have to wait before we go and give him that promotion, but that's certainly in the cards. Our most skilled commander by far is General Giovanni Messi over here. Um, he doesn't actually start with any notable traits. He's got War Hero. Um, I, I, did, I did Wikipedia him before we started. Uh, he, he was around in, in, in WWI, and now here he is in WWII uh, doing some work for us as well. So he's got the discount to promotion cost. That's fine. He takes longer to reassign. Who cares about that? He's got the Army uh, Armor Officer, so Panzer Leader, Experience Factor 100%. The way this is written, it's not very clear as to necessarily what this this does, but we're gonna want him to um, lead tanks if we can. The thing is, in practice, we ain't got much in the way of tanks. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look into this in a second, but uh, don't get too excited about the tank game. On the southern flank, we'll grab another general. I guess we'll grab our level two here, General Hugo Caballero. Uh, old guard, so he gains experience slower. But his promotions are cheaper. It's fine. None of these really matter too much. The, um, the slower experience gain sort of sucks, but the max entrenchment's kind of handy, so I guess it's fine. Career officer doesn't really matter too much. Cautious, so he's slower at planning. He's reduced chance of getting wounded in combat. I mean, when your generals get wounded in combat, they can't lead the army for, you know, X number of days or whatever. So I guess that's nice, but again, generally speaking, not very impressed. And the thing happens down here. Everyone's a career officer. Woo! Um, we do have the uh, inflexible strategist, which sounds like it could be bad with a negative trait, but in practice, it's just a bonus to defense and logistics. Wait, what does logistics do? Boy for logistics. Because it's not logistics wizard. I don't know. I'm going to have to uh, re-googlify it. I'm assuming this modifies their, the, um, the amount of supply and or fuel or something like that, that we need. But I actually don't know. I'm going to have to double check what the logistics stat does here. Because, yeah, it's not very obvious. But anyway. Um, and I mean, the people have skill in different categories. That is true. See, skill 3, reduce supply consumption. Actually, honestly, might be nice over here. Anyway, he's our level 2 dude. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Let's draw a front line here. Now, our southern flank likely won't advance much. But we'll still go ahead and give him a battle plan to go and push up. Um, with uh, Ethiopia, we do need to control all three of the victory points. So Addis Ababa, Harar, and Gondar over here, right? Gondar calls for aid. Um, we need to control all three. Very likely we won't be able to do a push from the south. Mostly we're going to be doing the push from the north. So I'm going to set another battle plan. By the way, I'm using hotkeys here. So to draw front line, the hotkey is Z, or Z if you're feeling nasty. Um, and the hotkey for an offensive line is X. And you do those a lot, so it's worth le learning those two hotkeys. Um, just because they're very, very, very common action, and it can save you some clicking. All right, so you guys are in position, and that's great. I'm going to hit go with the battle plan. I'm going to hit go with the battle plan to the south, too, although it's very likely just uh, nothing's going to happen down there, but that's okay. We have some other troops sitting around. What we're going to do, I'm going to shift-click on here to select all of our unassigned divisions, and I'm just going to throw you into a new army as well, just to help us organize a little bit, but then we won't be doing much with them. I'm going to make a new theater here, just to keep things a little clearer. The first one is going to be called Africa, and the other theater doesn't matter right now. Um, we don't really need more troops down here, but a little bit more can speed up. In particular, I'm going to grab our three tank divisions. Again, a little asterisk next to these tank divisions. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and send them on to the Northern Army. Um, I did do a couple of um, practice games of this earlier on just to see how the, sh the the start shakes out, especially with some some shenanigans we're going to be doing here with uh, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and Austria, in fact. More on that later. Um, and anyway, uh, the tanks do get here in time and do actually help probably shave a couple of days off the, uh, the overall attack. Um, again, the more sort of manual sort of um, rearrangement you can do of your troops over here, the faster it can go. But mostly I just like making battle plans and hitting play. That's the fun part of the game to me. Uh, all right. We've got that. We've got that. What, do, what else do we need to do to plan for the Ethiopian War? Oh, air power. Yes. Okay. So we've got, we've actually got a good number of planes. We've got some set up in Eritrea over here. We've got a wing of fighters, tactical bombers, and close air support. Currently all standing by. Adding air superiority over the... So it's this huge East Africa uh, air zone. Look how big this air zone is. And look at the range. Our fighters reach to here. I think that the fighters have the shortest range. And then close air support? Might be wrong. 
fighters range 570 kilometers close air support 700 kilometers yeah okay so that's uh, that's how far fighters can reach that's how far our close air support can reach and this is how far our tactical bombers can reach none of these are tremendously far but having air superiority and close air support over here is gonna be nice especially there's so many mountains and things the, th the thing is normally the war in ethiopia here goes really fast but every now and again it can really run itself into a bit of a quagmire and slow down and just be annoying um so especially if you don't remember to put out your planes because they do make a fair difference so we're going to tell our planes to do air superiority we're going to do close air support and we're going to go way over here now at the start of the game your planes are terrible at night because of i mean we've got no radar so there's there's really no ability to see at night and operate at night and things that being said on the other side anti-air and whatever if if ethiopia has any is also not very effective at night so maybe it's safe for us to operate at night and that's going to be okay depending on the situations we may or may not want to turn this on or off one of the things to keep in mind with planes and this is one of those things that's really not obvious when you start off everything that's mechanical so planes tanks that sort of thing has a reliability stat the reliability stat is the chance that we will lose equipment randomly from some sort of accident or something like that um, exploding in a fiery ball of death when lightly bumped. Excellent description over here. Um, and I don't, um, I don't have the math memorized for this or anything like that, but basically every time, um, an air wing, for example, starts a mission. So they take off to provide some air superiority or whatever. Um, so they take off, they fly around for a while, they land. And then after a, few, a little while, they take off again and repeat the mission. Every time they do that, there's a chance that they just crash and explode. And this is based heavily on reliability. And so as a result, Early on, when your night ability for your planes is really low, it may literally not be worth having them take off at night because you're going to end up losing a bunch of planes to low reliability without having the rest really accomplishing much. Now, with that in mind, I don't know where the break-even point for these things are. I'm going to leave the day-night cycle on for this one, um, mostly because I'm not expecting any opposition, <clears throat> so it should just be a lot of free bonuses to the combat, and I think that's okay. We may want to deploy another air wing to, to the south here in the, the uh, Somaliland airport um, just to provide actual range coverage over the southern area. Again, the southern flank's not really going to advance much, but it may be worth doing. So I'm going to click here. <clears throat> I'm just going to look for another fighter wing if I can remember what they look like. These guys over here. So these guys from PMO. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move you to this airport. Uh, I'm going to tell you to be active in East Africa. And you're going to provide air superiority. I'm not going to throw close air su um, support down here. As long as we got a little more air superiority, it should be okay. And it'll give us more coverage over the whole zone, which will feel okay. Anyway, with that, we've got our battle plans. They're active. We can basically just ignore what's going to happen here because it's more or less going to happen on its own. Although once the tanks arrive, we'll probably use it to help us uh, get a flank in on Addis Ababa. All right. Let's deal with the rest of the buzz over here. I did warn you guys we're very likely to not unpause in this first episode, right? Standard quill. Let's talk about research. As Italy, we start with a whopping four research slots. Let me tell you, given the fact that we were just playing as the left KMT in uh, China and started with two research slots, these four research slots feel like a hell of a luxury. We can also get a fifth research slot very early on over here. Four national focuses in, we can get ourselves an extra research slot. And I think conventionally the thing might be to rush that. We are going to be delaying it for a few different reasons. Uh, but four research slots is great. The problem is we still have this minus 30% to our tech research speed because of being on elite difficulty. This is going to have a huge impact on our game. Now, our start's going to be pretty standard. We're going to go over to industry because we do need to get our industry rocking as early as possible. We're going to unlock the basic machine tools, which is a prereq for a few things. We are going to unlock construction so we can build our new factories as quickly as possible. We are also going to go over to engineering. And we're going to pick up electronic mechanical engineering. So very, very typical thing. Uh, get some research speed boosts and we can keep going down here, unlocking some radar, radio, all that kind of stuff. And then we got a fourth slot and we've got some options. Now, I'm a little bit torn here because there's a few different things I would love to do. Well, one thing I would love to do is unlock the super heavy battleship hull, but we'll come back to ships in a little bit. We are definitely going to need more oil. We actually have, despite the fact that we have a pretty sizable navy, um, I don't know how we compare uh, to necessarily everything else, but if we take a look, so 152 ships, if we take a look at France, we 
should, depending on our intel and various things, have more ships. Now, different, there are different uh, ship like sizes and classes and things like that, so I, I don't know necessarily how we match up, but that's pretty good. Um, even if you look at the UK, who's obviously the undisputed king of the navy, is, let, let's call them, let's say they have 150 ships. Or, sorry, 250 ships is what I meant to say here. Let's say they have 250. At 150, we're, we're you know, within the ballpark. I mean, it's weird to say because they have, like, nearly twice as many as we do. But in terms of naval power, we're we're up in there. I mean, Germany's got around 40. Um, United States at the start, how many do you have? All right, so again, you're sort of on par with the UK. But you can see as Italy, we have a lot of ships. Now, those ships run on fuel is one of the big changes to the game that has happened at some point. There is actual fuel, which has to be refined from oil. And let's see, how much do how many do we produce per day right now? I'm squinting. It looks like we produce 48 units of fuel per day. Oh, that, is that a lot? I don't know. How, how much are we going to burn per day? What's our maximum consumption? 10,000? So we can consume up to 10,000 barrels of fuel a day and reproduce a whole 48. It's amazingly bad. Also, I like that our fuel capacity is 230,000, which means that if we filled up every fuel silo we have in the entire country, we could run our ships for 23 days. Well, I say ship, mostly it is. If you look at the Navy, the Navy is the 8.5K a day consumption. It can really chew up a lot of fuel. Um, a big part of that will be the capital ships, which use tons of gas to make anything happen. Um, but even just our destroyers and submarines will eat up a fair chunk of that. Our planes as well, as if, if we deploy them all, will be pretty thirsty too. Um, and then our army, we do have, we have those three tank divisions. Again, I keep feeling like I'm making air quotes every time I say tank divisions. Why is that? Let's take a look at our, <clears throat> our so-called tank divisions are, uh, are mostly horses and dudes and trucks. And then they have like, they have like a pet tank as a, um, uh, what am I looking for? Like a mascot of the team? That's, that's really what's going on here with our, our a light tank or our fast armored divisions here. Divisione Stellari. I'm, um, I feel bad. But we're going to be renaming our, our division templates. Um, so I'm going to call this Fast Armored. I, I, part of me wants to stay with the the original names, you know, in, in the original language. Um, except I have a... <laughs> I'm bad at pronouncing things. So we're going to we're gonna do some renaming. Uh, instead of Divisione de Fanteria or, or whatever, it's going to be an infantry division. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, I kind of like Alpina here, but no, we're going to call them Mountaineers. God, I'm so boring. But it's going to avoid some problems. Now, at some point, we're going to talk about these uh, colonial divisions. What's interesting here, our, our so-called infantry division is just six brigades of infantry and some dudes with shovels. If we compare colonial divisions, it's six d infantry brigades and no shovels. That's the only difference between our, our, our so-called full and proper strong infantry and these weak-ass colonial divisions. They're exactly the same as one another. Um, so really what these are going to be, uh, early on, we're going to use them effectively interchangeably because they have just about the same amount of juice. The infantry is going to be a little bit more, um, potent as a defender. An engineering company adds some defense, which is really nice, like a considerable amount of defense, um, as well as just letting us entrench and dig in more. So our infantry are really good at defending. Um... These guys, well, I mean, plain infantry is still never going to be a great attacker. By the way, so if you're new to Hearts of Iron, how do you evaluate some of these things? You know, defense versus attack versus whatever. Your divisions have hit points. Now, hit points aren't actually... They're, they're not... This, this is not the primary stat that you're going to be operating around. Um, hit point determines mostly how much damage you can take before, yeah, you're destroyed and losses and whatever. But in terms of winning and losing an actual battle, organization is really the hit point bar you're looking at. Organization is like is like morale, that sort of thing. When organization reaches zero, the attack has to stop. If you were defending, you now have to run away. If you were attacking, well, you simply start stop attacking. This is what happens when your organization goes down to nil. This is one of the reasons I like the organization recovery trait on my commanders, uh, because it lets you just recover from those battles more often. Um, even if you're not just, you know, even if you're not losing them, let's say you're attacking and winning. So you attack, you win, you move forward. Well, you still lost some organization in there. So your your troops are going to have to stop and rest for a bit to regain your their org before they can kind of continue to push forward at maximum strength. So increasing that recovery rate, I think, is very handy. Now, so organization is the, the real clock for how long you can operate in combat. Now, obviously, you're taking damage from attacks over here. Um, 
We can talk about the difference between soft attack and hard attack a little bit more later on, but um, basically each unit has a certain amount of hardness. Mostly that represents armor, right? So tanks have a high amount of hardness and infantry, which is squishy, squishy humans, have no hardness whatsoever. So each round of combat, there's basically a percentage roll between uh, hardness and softness to see um, what kind of damage you're gonna take on this particular round. So infantry divisions are always going to be hit by soft attack. And generally speaking, things do a lot more soft attack damage than anything. For example, infantry versus infantry. Anyway, so these things will bring down things like your organization, for example. Defense and breakthrough are really heavily tied to organization. So basically, defense and breakthrough work exactly the same. Defense is when you are defending from attack. Breakthrough is when you are the attacker. And what these do is they provide an, extra, an initial shield versus attack points. Basically, people have to burn through either your defense or your breakthrough, again, depending on if you're attacking or defending. They have to kind of burn through these before they start hitting your organization. And it works on a round-to-round -round basis, and it sort of counters attack and whatever, blah, blah, blah. But this is giving you a good sense as to whether this unit should be used to attack or defend. And generally speaking, infantry is really good at defense and not so good at attacking. If we compare our <clears throat> quote-unquote armored divisions, <sighs> barely so. Uh, but you can see this light tank, um, well, it's still a division, so it still adds a little bit of defense, mostly adds a ton of breakthrough, and it actually gives us negative organization. Tanks have very poor organization, um, and they don't have much in the way of defense normally. We have a lot of defense in this division because we have a lot of what is effectively infantry over here, which is all defense. But if this was a pure tank group, we'd have no defense, really low organization, but a ton of breakthrough. So as long as we're attacking, we can go and go and go and last a fairly long time. But the second we're, ha we're put on the back foot and um, we're being attacked as a tank division, we will just collapse as if we're made out of paper. Anyway, bit of a discussion for people who might be newer to the game. Um, so these colonial divisions, I'm going to call all these garrisons 2Rs, 1S, or the other way around, 2Rs, 1S, I think. I think that looks right. Um, I'm going to call these a garrison, and I'm going to give them a different icon. I, mean, I like to use um, this icon for a somewhat sturdier garrison division, like something like this. Pure defense, nothing fancy, very cheap to build. Um, and often I'll build another type of garrison with the pawn icon that might just be two infantry. Super lightweight divisions. And these are good for situations where you need to cover a vast amount of territory, but without very beefy troops. I like to use them for my, my coastal defense. They're also really good in Africa because Africa tends to have vast amounts of territory, but no one can deploy really heavy troops anywhere. So having lighter troops is fine. The other nice thing is when you're operating places with poor supply because they are maybe further from the homeland and uh, it might be difficult to get resources there. Infrastructure might be low, um, desert mountains, those sorts of things. Um, you will um, appreciate having divisions that don't need as many supplies to operate, uh, especially not needing any fuel. So we will probably make use of a template like this for um, a fairly long time. Again, early on, despite the perception that our infantry division is much more powerful than this garrison division, they are effectively the same strength. So we'll be making use of that as we go forward. Let's go ahead and finish our research slot here. So I think we we're discussing what we we're going to get. Um, so part, there's, there's, you know, super battleship is going to be good. Uh, we could start on some of our ground troops. We could work on the 1936 version of the light tank, which is quite a bit better than the 1934 version. But I think tanks are going to be the play, the area of the game we really have to sacrifice here playing on elite. Because of the 30% tech penalty, we're going to research so much slower, something's got to give. And I think it's going to have to be tanks. Even though that, that hurts my heart, it really does. Maybe um, we can do, uh, not Lend-Lease, what is, what is the uh, word I'm looking for? Uh, oh, license production, right? Maybe we can license production from whoever we end up being friends with. Might be the Soviet Union, might be the Germans, I don't know. Either way, we're kind of partnering with a bad guy. Let's try not to think about that too much. Um, so, yeah, some options are worse than others, let, let, let's be right out there. Uh, although some of them do have really good tank designs, I'm just saying. Anywho, so we might do some Lend-Lease. That will come quite a bit later because Lend-Leasing, uh, so you, basically that you borrow a blueprint from someone so that you can produce their tanks without having to research it. You do have to basically pay them by giving up some of your, um, your military factories is the way it kind of works out. We may do that later on, but I don't think we're going to research tanks ourselves. 
what I'm going to research early on is I'm going to research this fighter. Now, I played through different um, iterations and mixes as to whether we were using like regular fighters or let's say light fighters versus heavy fighters over here. There are that decision of whether you you specialize or, or build around light fighters versus heavy fighters is significant because it has a huge impact on many areas of your doctrine, your land, sea, and obviously air. In particular with the sea, as Italy here, we start off with the 1936 version of every ship model other than the carriers. We have no carrier tech whatsoever. And that's really good starting with, with this. We are up to date. We've got the latest designs on absolutely everything. Carriers in real life are the god kings of the sea. Um, this was basically figured out in World War II that carriers and air superiority just dominate everything else. And uh, since then, battleships have just been just gone. They don't, they don't exist, um, is, is effectively the situation. In previous iterations of Hearts of Iron 4, carriers were also like by far the god kings of the game. Right now, the way the balance of the game is, if I've, I've been trying to do some research on the various metas and things like that, it looks like carriers are a little bit, um, a little less impressive uh, in terms of things. Uh, and it really does depend on the, the combination of various things you do. It really depends heavily on where you operate and so on. But um, I think if you're far from land, like if you're operating in the Pacific, I think you still need your carrier fleet because you still need some air superiority. But here, if we're really concerned about control over the Mediterranean, we can have all the air presence we need simply from our from our airport, our ground-based airports, and we should be able to cover all the Mediterranean. So we don't really need carriers. As a result, I thought, well, if we don't need carriers, so if you want carriers, you got to research all the carrier hulls. Then you also have to research the the fighters and the naval bombers, actually, and then you have to research the carrier variant. So that's a lot of extra research. Whereas if you ignore carriers. You could just go heavy fighters. Simplifies your research. And we are a little starved for research. Let's compare some of the stats over here of the fighters. If we go, by the way, if you can shift click to open separate windows. If we compare here, the regular fighter versus the heavy fighter, they're fairly similar, especially at tier one over here. They have the same max speed, for example. This is this is not, no longer the case later on, as we'll look in a bit. The production cost is remarkably similar, 24 versus 28. So you'll build light fighters slightly faster than heavier fighters, but but not necessarily that much more. Um, heavy fighter has better air attack stats. It provides more air superiority. Um, uh, it is actually worse at hitting ships, apparently. Not that that really matters. And it has a much larger range. The big difference, though, between a light fighter and a heavy fighter is the agility. And this is substantial. Double the agility. And agility is a stat. It, it's not obvious. Like, all the most of the combat mechanics and, well, honestly, all of the Paradox games are fairly... Fairly opaque. You got to go to the wiki. You got to read forum posts. You got to do this to have people sort of analyze how the combat might work. Sometimes there's some guesswork and try to figure out what that means and run experiments to see how it is. On paper, a lot of people figured that these tier one um, planes, or in fact, even when you get to the tier threes, right? If we compare the level three light fighter and heavy fighter over here, a lot of people felt that on paper, they should be relatively similar in terms of their impact. And the big thing with the heavy fighter is their extreme range compared to the regular one. Basically almost double the entire time. And this is huge. That combined with the fact that they provide more points of air superiority means that if you are interested in achieving air superiority over a region, the best way to do it was heavy fighters. Because range is incredibly important to get more mission efficiency. Because if you don't have enough range to cover a whole um, air zone, your efficiency is going to go down significantly. So you should get much better mission efficiency with um, with heavy fighters, um, and they provide more air superiority per unit, so you will need fewer fighters to get 100% get air superiority. The thing is, when it comes to actually fighting each other, if light fighters and heavy fighters fight each other, the light fighters will win fairly significantly in most situations. And the big reason is, as it turns out, the most important stats when you are dealing with a fighter is speed and agility. Whereas the light fighter and heavy fighter tier ones have exactly the same speed. Once you get down to the tier threes, the light fighters have more speed and all along they have more agility. The tier ones have double agility and here we're closing in a nearly triple, 2.5 times the agility here. Um, and it is pretty significant. 
the costs are the same here. Again, the production costs are nearly the same. The material's the same. Weirdly, and this almost feels like a bug to me, the Tier 1 Light Fighter needs more material than the Tier 1 Heavy Fighter. This feels like a bug to me. Um, maybe it's because the Pre-War Fighter and the Tier 1 Fighter over here, maybe they wanted to increase the cost, but I, I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning for that is, but for some reason the Light Fighter it takes more material, and I don't know. So I kept going back and forth. Heavy Fighters plus Tactical uh, Bombers are a really good pairing. Really, really good pairing. They naturally fit together just because of range. I mean, the Heavy Fighter still doesn't have the range of the Tactical Fighter, but they have a lot. Anyway, we're going to go with the Fighters. I, I, I'm, I went back and forth, and I'm going to research it right away. I think it's going to be handy. The fact of the matter is, even though we're not going to use carriers, the ranges involved in where we need our planes aren't going to be that significant. Especially, we're going to have an airbase here, here. Um, hopefully, take the Belarius and build an airbase here. And we do, and it's easy to forget, but we have the island over here. Um, and this has also got an airport. So we should have air coverage over the entire Mediterranean uh, by doing that. All right, we're, uh, we're 35 minutes in. We haven't unpaused yet. Let's go and... Well, let's... We're going to have to put a cut here. We're going to deal with our, our factories next episode, and we'll also talk about our plan with the National Focus, which is actually going to be to not set a National Focus. Folks, I hope this is going to be a great run. I'm very excited for it. Again, I sort of dabbled some practice runs before the start to try to get a feel for things. Um, one thing I can tell you, the game will change dramatically on non-historical AI, depending on what people do. If France and Czechoslovakia join the Entente, that's going to massively modify what we do in the early game. If people do certain actions that ratchet up world tension a little faster than expected, that's also going to have an impact on an early game because we're going to be trying to rush a few war targets as early as possible before the democracies can guarantee nations. And so if the world tension gets up to 25%, democracies can start guaranteeing nations. So we'll see if we can uh, dodge that or not. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, do, of course, make sure to subscribe. Otherwise, I'm going to see you guys next time. Bye-bye.